discussion about enrolling in a university course. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Registrar's office, this is Pam. Yes, hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number? Yes, this is Mitchford University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first year and transferring students and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you? No, not really. I'll tell you what, why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Your address there, Richard? Unit 12, 15 Sportsman Avenue. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-M-A-N, Mermaid Beach. Four double five four. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. Uh, oh four one four. Hang on a minute. I don't call myself usually. Uh, I think it's oh four one four six five eight three three nine. Yes, that's it. Okay. Now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. Dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay, that looks fine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best, uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure, there are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep, yeah, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about the ozone layer and CFCs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Today, it is well known that CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons, can do immense damage to the ozone layer, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation from the sun. However, it was as recently as the mid-1970s when the connection between CFCs and ozone layer destruction was first established. The story starts back in 1957, when James Lovelock invented the electron capture detector. This is a machine that can detect very small amounts of a chemical compound in the atmosphere. Indeed, using the machine, it was Lovelock who was the first person to detect the widespread presence of CFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. In 1973, Lovelock, on a research trip which he'd funded himself, measured the amount of CFCs in the atmosphere in the Arctic and in Antarctica, but unfortunately came to the wrong conclusion that CFCs are not harmful to the environment. Following on from this work, though, in 1974, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina published the very first scientific paper on the connection between CFCs and ozone depletion. This quickly prompted the world's first ban on the use of CFCs which was enacted in 1975 by the U.S. state of Oregon. Further bans followed. In 1978, the United States and several European countries banned the use of CFCs in spray cans. CFCs were still allowed to be used, though, for refrigeration and in solvents. It was in the mid-1980s that scientists in Antarctica observed a huge depletion in the ozone layer above them often called the hole in the ozone layer. This led, in 1987, to the signing of the Montreal Protocol, which called for further reductions in the production and use of CFCs, and then, two years later, to a European Union agreement to ban the production of all CFCs by the end of the century. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So why exactly are CFCs so harmful? One of the reasons CFCs were so popular in the production of solvents and refrigeration coolants is that they are unreactive. That is, they don't react easily or at all with other chemical compounds. It's this property, however, that also makes them dangerous. Because they are unreactive, it's very difficult for them to be broken down. This gives them a long lifespan more than 100 years in some cases, and allows them to rise into the upper levels of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, unchanged. There, ultraviolet radiation from the sun starts to break them down, 
freeing the chlorine atoms from the CFCs. It's this chlorine that helps destroy the ozone there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Here an interview conducted by an interviewer Spiegel with a scientist, Peter Piot, who discovered Ebola, a dangerous disease. Both of them are conversing about the disease and its origin. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Professor Piet, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in 1976. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high-security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was. And there were no high-security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa. When we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope, the World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high-security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking and he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. <laughs> my only thought was, oh shit! We immediately disinfected everything, and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We were finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, what the hell is that? The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age. But I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related, unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks discussing the question. We definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name. But the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Cheese is one of those foods that we tend to take for granted as always having been with us. And it's odd to think that someone somewhere must have discovered the process to make cheeses. That takes place today. In the studio to tell us all about it is Monica Maxwell. Today, we all know that the process of making cheeses takes place when microorganisms get into milk and bring about changes in its physical and biochemical structure. Well, obviously, we don't know who discovered the process, but it's thought that it came from Southwest Asia about 8,000 years ago. In the early time, there were mainly two types of cheeses. One of them was rather tasteless and bland in the case of the so-called fresh cheeses, which are eaten immediately after the milk has coagulated. And another one was rough-tasting and salty in the case of the ripened cheeses, which are made by adding salt to the soft fresh cheese and allowing other biochemical processes to continue so that a stronger taste and a more solid texture resulted. The ancient Romans changed all that. They were great pioneers in the art of cheese making, and the different varieties of cheese they invented and the techniques for producing them spread with them to the countries they invaded. This spread of new techniques took place between about 60 BC and 300 AD. You can still trace their influence in the English word cheese, which comes ultimately from the Latin word Cassius, that's C-A-S-E-U-S. -E At this stage in history, people weren't aware in a scientific way of the role of different microorganisms and enzymes in producing different types of cheese, but they knew from experience that cheese's tastes were relevant to something. If you kept your milk or your pre-cheese mixture at a certain temperature or in a certain environment, things would turn out in a certain way. 
In the 19th century, with the increasing knowledge about microorganism, there came the next great step forward in cheesemaking. Once it was known exactly which microorganism was involved in the different stages of producing a cheese, and how the presence of different microorganisms affected the taste, it was possible to introduce them deliberately and to industrialize the process. Nowadays, cheese is made on a large scale in factories, although the small producer working from his dairy farm continued to exist and still exists today. Cheesemaking moved very much into the world of technology and industrial processes, although because the aim is still to produce something that people like to eat, there's still an important role for human judgment. People still go round tasting the young cheese at different stages to see how it's getting on, and may add a bit of this or that to improve the final taste. Whatever the scale of production, there is still room for the development of art alongside the technology. That is the end of part four. You now have half. <laughs>